Welcome to Igniting the Worldwide Spiritual Wildfire We Need Now Global Online Summit. We live in extraordinary times, both exceptionally promising and radically uncertain. Yet as we dive into uncharted waters and move closer to a critical tipping point, we see a worldwide awakening beginning to catch fire. If you're listening to this summit, you are definitely part of the amazing shift that is beginning to transform the world like a spiritual wildfire. In this summit, you'll hear from 22 amazing speakers who each in their own unique ways have been the visionaries and the pioneers leading the way to the paradigm shift that is unfolding now. This summit offers inspiration, healing, and empowering practical tools to anyone who is ready to courageously use their own light to help spread this worldwide spiritual wildfire. Together we can create a new world based in compassion, wisdom, justice, and joy. My name is Joan Diargo and I am your host, creator, and producer of the Spiritual Wildfire Summit and I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for registering. And today I am really excited, very honored, and so very grateful to interview Dr. Scylla Elworthy. Scylla has been three times nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for developing effective dialogue between nuclear weapons policymakers worldwide and their critics with the Oxford Research Group she founded in 1982. Peace Direct, voted Best New Charity in 2005, goes from strength to strength under brilliant young leadership founded by Scylla in 2002 to fund, promote, and learn from local peace builders in conflict areas. Scylla was advisor to Archbishop, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Sir Richard Branson in setting up the elders and it was awarded the Nuwano Peace Prize in 2003. She co-founded Rising Women, Rising World in 2013 and FemQ in 2016 to establish qualities of feminine intelligence for men as for women as essential for building a safer world. Her TED Talk on nonviolence has been viewed by over 1.4 million people and her book Pioneering the Possible, Awaken Leadership for a World a world that works and continues to receive critical acclaim from experts in the field. She's ambassador for Peace Direct, a counselor of the World Future Council, patron of Oxford Research Group, advisor to the Syria Campaign, and the Institute for Economics and Peace. She advises the leadership of selected international corporations as well as young social entrepreneurs. Scylla is a mother, stepmother, and grandmother and loves messing about in her garden near Oxford in the UK. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here and to share your wisdom with the listeners today. Many, many thanks. It's been a great pleasure to meet you, John. Yes, great. Well, let's go ahead and just dive right into the questions. So, you know, you one of your many gifts is helping us to look at the big picture, just to discover ways to solve the global crises we face. And you often quote Einstein when he says, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So what current shift in consciousness is needed today to help us solve the global crises we face? Joan, I believe it's more than a shift. It's a leap in consciousness um, because the, um, the way that we've treated the planet, the way that we treated each other, and the crisis situation we've brought ourselves into worldwide yeah. is so grave now uh, that it's only through a major um, seismic shift, really, in how we relate to each other, how we devise our ways of communicating worldwide, Mm -hmm. how we elect our leaders, and how we um, empathize with those who are suffering at such a rate at the moment and so deeply from the mistakes that we humans have made. Particularly, I'm thinking of the Syrian war. I've just come back from working with those who are looking after Syrian refugee children mm. in Turkey and in Greece. And the, uh, 
the harm that's been done to these children's psyche, to, to, their, um, to their way of seeing the world. They are so highly traumatized. Mm. It's going to take years of care and love um, and probably even three generations for the damage done by that war to those children wow. to be healed. So that's just one example of the huge, um, uh, the huge tasks ahead of us. And we can talk also about the skills we now have to make that change in consciousness. Yes. Wow. So, I mean, one of the things too that I've heard you say is that um, we, we need to really be pioneers for this new leap of consciousness that's necessary. And you've said that true pioneers are fueled by their vision of how a new world could be and dare to take on what's never been done before. So what does that mean for our times today and what we're faced with? Like, what does that mean? Well, I, I think the big question that's helpful for all of us to ask ourselves is what breaks your heart? Mm -hmm. Because that's where the energy lies. Um, you know, we can put our energy into all sorts of things that we kind of mind about, but it's what breaks our heart that really gives us the get up and go, the stamina to keep going on something that we care about. And the second question is, what are your skills? Mm -hmm. So if you're good at social media, if you're good at gathering a group of people around you, mm -hmm. if you're good at um, teamwork, if you're good at um, raising money, then apply that skill to the issue you care about. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to, I can assure you that in a few weeks even, you're going to gather a group of people around you. And in, in, a, in a year or so, you're going to have started a whole initiative or even have joined somebody else's initiative that really meets what you most agonize over and what you most long to do yeah that's secret. thank you so much for that i've heard many people say that the the spiritual ideal of our time is really action that it's time to to really get out and and be active and yet it's also a reflection of what it is inside of us too, right? So tell us a little bit more about how those two are so directly interconnected. Well, absolutely, because unless, well, what we find, uh, and I work now with, uh, over, uh, with an organization, the one I founded called Peace Direct, that works with uh, 1,800 locally led peace initiatives all over the world. Uh -huh. You can... You can find out about them on a, a wonderful website called Peace Insight that maps the whole world and all the peace initiatives in the world, including in the United States. And it's working with those people that I realized that those who do what we would call the inner work, yes, the daily self-inspection, it's the ability to examine ourselves a bit like having a helicopter above our heads oh. and watching our behavior and being able to be um, observant of when we're when our ego is in play mm -hmm. when we're being a bit uh, self self-serving mm -hmm. um, and it's that self-reflection which is so vital on a daily basis that gives us the self-knowledge that makes us strong when difficulties arise. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you. Most of us have a shadow, well, we all have a shadow side that consists of our fear, our anger, our jealousy, all our dark sides. And if we've got the courage to really look at that dark side, Mm -hmm. Then when something happens that requires our fearlessness or our big heartedness, by having already looked at our dark side, we don't project that dark side out in the bad moment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, I have a colleague who works in northwest Pakistan and trains young people 
to go into the religious schools and identify those being trained for jihad. Mm. And the, the people she trains go home with those jihadists to their parents, sit down with the parents and mm. discuss why the Holy Quran would not approve of suicide bombing. Wow. And they have dissuaded over 200 young men from carrying out their mission. Wow. And if that's not courage and conflict prevention, I don't know what is. Wow, that's amazing. So what we're talking about is developing in all of us the ability to be present in the moment when there's an accident, when there's something that requires our full presence. And in my way of thinking, it's only when we've done the inner work on a daily basis for months or years, um, we, become, we become stronger, mm -hmm. we become more resilient, and we become probably a bit more modest. Um, in, in that mm -hmm. our ego is, is, is a little less rampant. Wow. And so that self-reflection is really a key part of that, isn't it? And, and that could be, um, I mean, for the listeners, I mean, that could be taking time, five or ten minutes in the morning to reflect. But I have a feeling that you're inviting us to really integrate it into, um, you know, our entire day, if possible, right? That's that mindfulness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and certainly in my own case, I find I'm, I'm not all that good at sitting quietly for half an hour. Okay. But what is great is to develop a practice of very deep breathing. Mm. That's like an in breath for a count of five with your, through your nose, in breath through your nose for a count of five, pause for a moment, and then an out breath for a count of six through your mouth and then a pause, and then the same thing again. And to do that 10 or 15 times, mm. as many times during the day as you can. And it's very, very useful, and I'll tell you why. In those pauses, I find, come the, um, the essential things that are needed in that moment. Often it's something I've forgotten to do. Mm. Uh -huh. Often it's a kind of a gem that maybe the universe wants us to use today or mm. today but there's always some wisdom that drops in in, in those pauses those are the key parts oh that's beautiful thank you there and there really truly is magic in those pauses and isn't there if we just mm -hmm. you know, slow down and get still and even listen yeah yeah mm -hmm. thank you so much so, you know, Silly, you've said that it's, and I love how you say, it, say this, you said that it's time for us to awaken our fierce feminine intelligence, because when we do, we can move mountains. Mm -hmm. And you say that feminine intelligence, what you call FemQ, is needed by both women and men to face the current crises and to bring about the radical leap that is needed. So share with us, if you could please, what is FemQ? And um, why it's so needed now, as, especially as we face potential, you know, planetary collapse. Okay, yes. Well, if we look around, um, we see that we've managed to put in place leaders who are very immature. That's putting it mildly. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it it's um it's still a boys' club out there. I was at a big meeting in um, Turkey recently. And in the opening session, every single person on the platform, there were nine speakers, was male. Mm -hmm. It was also not representing different cultures at all. And so what all of us need, including those gentlemen on the platform, mm -hmm. to adopt some of the characteristics of feminine intelligence, which, as you just said, is available equally to men as it is to women. And I would say that there are five or six particular skills there. Okay. Um, the first one is listening. Um, we all think we're good listeners, but most of us are not. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's well worth testing yourself with a friend 
or uh, if you have a conflict with somebody uh, at work or in the family or in your child's school or wherever you could say the magic words which are would you be willing i love that phrase would you be willing mm -hmm. uh, would you be willing to spend 30 minutes with me mm. um, so that we can understand what's going on between us and in that in that 30 minutes i will ask you to speak first in the first person about how you feel about the conflict and i will listen to you so carefully mm. when you've finished I can repeat back to you more or less what you've said mm -hmm. you've felt behind what you said and if you're satisfied with that then we'll change over and i will speak for five minutes about the conflict between us and you can give me your full attention and then repeat back to me what you've heard yeah i can guarantee that at the end of that 10 minutes 15 minutes period we will have moved from the brain that mm -hmm. says I'm right and she's wrong to the heart that says, oh my goodness, is that how she feels? Mm. And then we've got a bridge between us. Then we can begin to explore and unpack what a conflict is. So that's what I call first class listening. Mm. And uh, I've taught it to the global presidents of major luxury corporations oh. and at first they kind of shrugged their shoulders and rolled their eyes and said <laughs> of course we know how to listen um but when when i insisted that they practice it um they said that um when they began to use it with their teams that they were able to resolve in 15 minutes wow what would previously have taken four hours and not being oh, wow there. that's pretty amazing right just with really opening up dropping down from our head into our hearts and creating that bridge to truly listen mm -hmm. yes that that is that's so effective wow and you know but what's so funny too though and maybe not so funny but is that you know often we associate the qualities of the feminine with weakness or frailty and I you know whether it's listening or really being open to our intuition or you know how how can we move beyond these associations that feminine intelligence is weakness or frail oh well I see it as <laughs> full of courage and um, I, I think that the um, one of the best examples of this is how we take a stand and I call it courageous conversations mm. um, and that is that you know how we all feel tense when we we know we must say something difficult to an employer or even to a colleague yes. and then we forget to breathe the brain freezes up we can't find the right words we feel fragile instead of feeling steady and grounded and everything we would hope to feel so um I, I've, I've taken some time to write down what are the skills for courageously taking a stand. Um, and I, I will send them to you and you can share them with everybody. But oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Yes. Shall I just go through them quickly with you? Please do. Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, get really clear about what it is that you want to say, what you mean. Keep it simple and give an example. Um, practice the words in front of a mirror before you're going to actually take your stand. And watch your posture, watch the tone of your voice. Because the, the more you can breathe before you stand up and say what you need to say, the more you can breathe, this will enable the blood to get to your brain so the brain can function and then your voice will deepen. And if, as your voice deepens, that gives you more authority. Mm. And then when you meet the person with whom you need to take a stand, keep breathing, and if at all possible, stand up to speak, mm. even if it seems funny, odd. And then ground your feet on the floor, um, as if you were standing on the bare earth. Mm. And 
the energy up through your body with your deep breaths. And then say what it is that you have to say. Mm. And I can guarantee that in that way you will, well, first of all, you'll know that you're talking for others as well as for yourself. And you're talking for fairness and better communication. Mm -hmm. But if you deliver what you have to say and looking calmly at the person that you want to influence, you will um, be able to convey your message and, um, and, and your message will carry the kind of strength that you really want to um, be basing your, what you want to say upon. So that's the, the, the gutsy side of, of, um, of what we call FEMQ or feminine intelligence. Mm, so very helpful. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that those steps are helpful, whether it's having a conversation with your partner or two world leaders, you know, coming together, right? Yes. Exactly. I've used it often with them. Um, when we were working with nuclear weapons policymakers for 21 years, I was often very frightened of them um, okay. and because they were very imposing and, and took any opportunity to shut you up, particularly mm -hmm. if you're a woman. And, and especially if I was saying something that they didn't want to hear. Mm -hmm. and so I had to learn this and it took me a while to, to really put it together and be able to teach it to other people. Well, thank you for sharing it here today. I know it's going to be very helpful. <laughs> so, you know, Scylla, I know that there are many, many revolutions happening all over the world right now um, with, you know, particularly women rising up and em embracing, you know, this feminine intelligence and men too. But I'm wondering what more is needed now so that we can truly restore the priority of life on this planet, what kind of mountains can we really move by integrating a FEMQ into our lives? And what is possible within our lifetime? I know that's a big, a lot right there, but what is needed now to really, really create this leap? Yeah. Well, first of all, we need many, many more women in policy-making positions, in okay. decision-making positions, because if we just look around us and see that the the decisions particularly being made on the environment are um, are still shameful so many big corporations are still flaunting the needs of the planet for um, better treatment let's put it like that yeah. and so um, I think one of the key things is to follow actually example from the United States where your wonderful ambassador, Swanee Hunt, um, set up an organization called Inclusivity oh. to get women into decision-making positions. And she offered a wonderful training. You could, you could Google Inclusivity and stay. I think they're still doing it. Okay. The, the, the proof of the pudding is that um, when the United Nations examined how many women were sitting around peace tables, in other words, peace negotiations. And they found in 2009, the average was two and a half percent. When that percentage rose to 10%, the peace agreement reached last 15 years longer. Wow. Now, and, and there's a good reason for that. Of course, if you, if you take a, um, a peace negotiation in Africa, for example, you would have warlords sitting at either side of the table and they'd be arguing over resources, money, votes, weapons, whatever, mm -hmm. in the peace agreement. As soon as you introduce women into the peace table, what they bring is all the fallout of war that they've had to pick up. In other words, the orphans, the care of the orphans, the care of the wounded, the PTSD, yes. the burial of the dead even. And when these issues are brought into the peace agreement, in other words, the, the picking up the pieces of the war, not just grabbing the spoils, uh, that's when you get 
real peace established rather than just simply an interim um, an interim agreement between two very powerful people two or three very powerful sets of people so um it's and that applies also in any aspect of our life as soon as you introduce a majority of people with feminine intelligence sitting around a negotiation you get a lot more care of the human elements that need to be attended to and obviously that's particularly true in our healthcare systems it's particularly true in the military and it's particularly true really wherever you look in decision making when there are more women mm. or more feminine intelligence there's more common sense and more uh, empathy for people mm -hmm. able to make decisions uh, in public as they would like to so thank you so it's really women really stepping forward and and moving into those positions those policy positions and and really speaking the truth and and sharing from their perspective yes exactly and, and even if you don't feel that you necessarily have the right cv or the right biography yeah. to be in that position just get your biography written and get your friends or anybody you know to put your biography forward as a qualified person to fill that vacancy uh -huh. whether it's a paid position or whether it's a voluntary position just get more feminine intelligence into our decision making okay great thank you so you know today you know many people feel hopeless and powerless in the face of what you know they see on tv or read in the news or in their communities um you know with the world in crisis with wars and violence um as well as the climate climate crisis so how do we get beyond hopelessness in this political maelstrom how how do we do that well i think i think we as women are particularly well suited to do that because we have to endure all kinds of um grueling uh, hardships that um meet us as as we get older and so we simply have to take a stand and we talked earlier about the best ways to take a stand mm -hmm. but it's now that in a way feeling hopeless if you'll forgive me is a luxury mm -hmm. we any one of us who has a roof over our head enough to eat mm -hmm. some education and has life in their body if not us who right and if not now when mm -hmm. now is the time and nobody is too small to make a difference you know what the dalai lama said <laughs> he said if you think you're too small to make a difference try sleeping with a mosquito <laughs> <laughs> so true so please don't indulge the luxury of thinking there's nothing you can do because there is always right. something. Then, thank you. And then it goes back to what you shared earlier about, well, then how, how do we get involved? Well, well, what is it that's breaking our hearts open? And what is our special skill set that can really you know, contribute to the, to the leap that we want to see in our, in our world right now? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It's, it's absolutely true. Many of us are held up by our inner critic. Does that ring a bell with you? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I once asked a room full of 300 leaders if there was anybody in the room who did not have an inner critic. No hands went down. Wow. Uh, so, uh, it, and even if you're extremely successful, you often have this little carping voice sitting on your shoulder. Yeah. and it, it can bring you down it can it can bring you down at key moments it can tell you you know you're being idiotic or how dare you speak up like that or you'll make a fool of yourself or all yeah. those things. oh yeah mm -hmm. so in the in the in the skill sets i'm going to send you is the um the routine i developed for dealing with my inner critic 
Um, I can run through it now if we've got time, but that's up to you. Oh, of course. I think that'd be really helpful. Because I, I think it's something that so many of us are faced with that can actually immobilize us or freeze us up. And we don't need to freeze right now. We need to really move forward. So yes, please do. Well, um, my inner critic tends to wake me up at three o'clock in the morning, almost muttering in my ear. You haven't prepared so enough for tomorrow. You're going to fall flat on your face. Um, you're going to make a fool of yourself. And I wake up and I start tossing and turning and I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I try to go back to sleep. It doesn't work. So what I've discovered I have to do is this. I have to get up and make a cup of tea because I'm British and I make up tea. <laughs> then I come back and I set out two cushions or pillows or chairs. And it's very important. You sit in, in the first chair and you say to the inner critic, why did you wake me up? And then you move and sit on the other cushion and you'll find you will answer in the aggressive voice of your inner critic. And it might say, to me, it will say, well, you know, you should have, you should have got a good deal more prepared for that talk you've got to give tomorrow. Honestly, you're just going to repeat the same old thing and it really won't go down very well. So um, I, think, I think it's you're heading for failure. And so I shift and go back to my cushion and then I have to be pretty tough with him. And I say, that is not very helpful. Tell me what you think I need to know. Um, I go back to his, his cushion. And he's calmed down a bit, I note. Mm -hmm. And he speaks a bit more reasonably. And he says, well, you know, you really ought to look up that, um, that quote that you know very well. It's, it's in such and such a book. And if you use that quote, that might help. And um, anyway, there's a lot more you need to do on that talk you've got to give tomorrow. And I go back to my, and I say, well, that's, that's a bit more helpful. Thank you, but um, what do you really know? Because you know something. It's like you've got a gem underneath your. I see. I see my critic. I'll just. This is for you. I see it as a dragon, a huge, massive, fire-breathing dragon, and underneath his left claw, he's got a diamond, and it's that that I know. Is something he knows. Oh. So I say to him. Please tell me what it is that you know that I need to know. And then I go back to his cushion and he begins to tell me. Um, and that's the way I've learned some of the most wow. important things in my whole life uh, is from that fire breathing dragon. Wow, it's so very helpful. And it's a very different approach than just shunning it or, or ostracizing it. You're actually creating a dialogue with it. That's brilliant. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Scylla, what is it that inspires you today? What inspires me is the incredible courage of those who have suffered unbelievably. Um, I've, um, I've had quite a bit to do with the fallout of the terrible Syrian war. Mm -hmm. And I'm so moved by the spirit of the refugees that I've met, people who had to go through excruciating pain and seen their loved ones bombed, mm -hmm. had to flee their houses in the middle of the night, dragging their children, um, unable to save older people, mm -hmm. um, being put in refugee camps. Then you go across the sea in leaky boats and finally arrive in Greece or in, um, in sometimes in Turkey. And meeting them and talking to them, they, what they've been through and they, they, the way they've managed to survive and not only survive, but come through with their hearts intact, oh. still caring for other people, moves me to tears. And, and if they can do that, my goodness, what can we do? You know, we who have the resources, we have the freedom to speak out. Most yeah. people don't. 
really many, many, many people in the world today don't have the freedom to speak out. So it's, to me, it's what inspires me is the, the way I'm meeting every day young people who won't be stopped. They are just mm -hmm. intent on building a better world. Mm -hmm. But we can't just leave it to them. We can't just say, you know, it's the Greta Thunberg generation. Right. It's, it's us older ones, whether we're parents or grandparents, who need to share our wisdom, encourage others and lead the way, show the way, um, give people the images of what can be done. Mm -hmm. And I record quite a lot of those images in stories in the books that you've mentioned. And mm -hmm. um, because I love examples mm -hmm. of what people can do and what people do do. Yeah. And I think it's in pioneer, pioneering the possible that there's um, many, many, many examples of what it's, what it's practical and what people are able to do now, anywhere, wherever you live in the world. Yes, yes, thank you. So maybe just one or two more questions. I'm, I'm curious, Silla, where do you seek your guidance? Where do you get your guidance from? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, when I moved into my house 20 years ago, um, I opened the <clears throat> doors of a, of a cupboard and out rolled a scroll, it was rolled up, and I unrolled it, and it was clearly a female figure, and uh, she was unfamiliar to me. I'll just see if I can find a picture of her to show you. And it turns out that, yeah, here we are, here she is. Um, can you see that? Yes, beautifully. Yes, thank now, you. She, I discovered, is the Chinese goddess of compassion. And if you can see, she is riding on the back of a red dragon. Yes, yes. A very stormy sea. Yes? Yes. Um, I can also send you the image of her. Anyway, I discovered a lot about her, and she is venerated in many countries in, in the Far East. Um, and now her followers are, are, are um, enlarging quickly all over the world. Not, there's no creed associated or belief system associated with her. She is just the goddess of wisdom. Mm. And whenever I don't know what to do, mm. I ask her. Mm. Um, I've, um, I've got um, many images of her and, and I just sit down, light a candle as I see you've done behind you. Yeah. and. Ask her straight questions. What should I be doing? And uh, she always has an answer. So that's part of where I get my ideas and my strength. But also my garden, which you uh. kindly at the beginning. Um, I'm an addict for the earth. I love <laughs> to have my hands in the earth, to stand on the earth in my bare feet to get filthy, dirty, plant seeds um, and harvesting them. Um, and even at this time of the year, in fact, today, I was out in the winter rain in, in the UK where I live, um, and I was planting seeds of broad beans for next year because they oh, like yes. to grow during the cold period. But it's the, the enormous benevolence and kindness of the earth that you know we've she's our mother but we have insulted her we have deserted her we have harmed her unbelievably mm -hmm. and she still cares for us and so that's uh, my gratitude to the earth is infinite and uh and she gives me such a lot of strength every single day mm. Thank you so much for that, yes. So, Scylla, as we wrap this incredible interview up, are there any final words or thoughts that you want to share with the listeners at all? Um, well, um, if, I'm not sure if your listeners are mainly in the United States, but... Um, I, I shall be coming to the United States in February of next year, but I, I have a lot of affection 
for for your country and um i'm um how should i put it deeply depressed about your leadership uh and i know that the good common sense of americans and the good heartedness of americans from all corners of the world who've gathered in your country um, to do better than this mm -hmm. in your next election. And um, I really stand behind you to bring about change with mm. all your heart and all your energy. Um, we, in my country, we have um, a leadership which is also very unwise, very immature. Um, and tomorrow is our general election. Uh -huh. You will know the results before you broadcast this interview. But um, it seems we're headed in a similar direction. And I'm um, encouraging everyone to make the changes they can locally in the local education system, in the local healthcare system. We have to take it into our own hands now uh -huh. and bring back common sense. Um, Compassion. Compassion is a huge attribute of FAMQ, feminine intelligence, and we're all capable of it. And we have to be exercising that every day. Mm. Thank you so much. So appreciated. I, I really appreciate you taking this time and I know this is gonna resonate with the listeners. And you offered so many practical, concrete things for us to integrate into our daily lives. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. Well, lovely to talk to you, Joan, and I wish you well with your wonderful program. All right, thank you so much, Scylla. All the best, lots of love. Thank you, bye-bye.